Is Caitlin mad at Barry for changing reality so something happens so that Killer Frost might come to be? I thought about that and I asked myself that question and the way I sort of see it is that you know this version of Caitlin Snow this is her life she doesn't remember Flashpoint and she doesn't remember that other timeline so she doesn't know anything else so I don't really think she's mad at Barry I think it's fascinating and you know also from a scientific perspective I think it's interesting to her but I don't think she's mad at him about it because this is all she knows do you think she's avoiding Barry right now? It seems like this season this is the least close they've been as that the working co-workers. I think I, Grant and I were just talking about this a couple weeks ago. Like Grant has not been as present in Star Labs as he has been, Barry has not been as present in Star Labs as he has been in past episodes. I think that's what's great about the show is that they've really allowed um, Caitlin and Cisco in particular and you know, whatever Wells is in the picture to keep moving everything forward at Star Labs. Barry's a little bit more out in the street, that sort of thing. But they used to go out for like, you know, coffee. Hey, coffee. I am always <laughs> pulling for more. I'm like, let's get Caitlin outside of Star Labs. Like whatever that looks like. Um, there is, there's, I was gonna say there's some social outings. There's a social outing in episode six, but um, Barry doesn't go, so you know. It's, it, that's what's great about an ensemble. It's not everybody has to be working all the time. There are different episodes that are bigger for different characters. I'm really happy because I've gotten to work with Keenan. I just said this to Keenan this morning. Like, I'm so glad we're having, we're getting some, getting to work together some more, which Speaking is new for me this year. Speaking of the ensemble cast, um, we, we went through a similar kind of thing with Cisco last season where he was afraid to show the team's powers and, and, and that kind of thing. What is motivating Caitlin to make this similar choice? What do you mean? Uh, she is, she's been keeping her... Her choice to hide it? Yes. Well, because I think she doesn't understand it. I think, you know, I think that conversation would be a little bit difficult. Like, hey guys, I don't have any answers, but here you go. Especially for Caitlin as a scientist and someone who is focused on always having the answers. I think she wants to get, get this figured out for herself before she comes to the team with, you know, her request from them, etc. How much fun are you having with this new Harrison... He's wild. He's, yeah, it's, it's fun. A lot of fun. How much, like last time we were here, you talked about how you were involved sort of in the molding of, of last season's Harrison. How involved were you this time around? Uh, uh, yeah, that's all me. <laughs> yeah, completely. It was like uh, last year I was trying to fill in gaps that we don't have on a daily basis on our show. We have like, a, we had a big bad, but not a daily antagonist. So. You know, everybody is very winning on our show. They're so great. Barry is great. Iris is great. Caitlin is great. Cisco is great. And I thought it'd be great if there was a guy who wasn't great. And that's what I was last year. To have a daily antagonist, somebody you couldn't trust, a malcontent, bit of a bitch, socially, <laughs> socially inept. But ultimately, he's a kind of a good guy. Uh, he seems, in the first season, he seems good, but he's bad. In the second season, he seems bad, but it's good, and this in the third season, well, I wonder what he is. Bit of a con man, but I thought, instead of filling in the thing that we, uh, that I did last year, there are gaps that we have in our show, and so in this season, I thought, well, I'm gonna fill in that gap and do it sort of in the same way, be part of something that's not a circle that we have in our show, and, but I didn't want to repeat myself from last year, so what I thought I would try this year was a guy who's a bit of a, he fills it up with comedy, if you will, or a bit of a, a bit of a con man. Same element of can you trust him or not is, is there, but in a, in a different way. So it's kind of a variation on, the, on, a, on a theme, and that theme being where are the gaps and where can I plug in and paint some colors that we don't have on our show without repeating myself from the other four Harrison Wells's that I've done. So. Last week we got a little montage of Wells from different <laughs> universes. Was that something, were they written specifically into the script or did you get to create um, different Wells characters? Uh, you know what's great, one of the things that's amazing about this show is that the Helbing brothers, uh, Greg Berlanti, again this is my third show for Greg, Greg is extremely trusting, you know, and I think partially it's because we've, you know, we've worked together for a decade plus and so I think to let a guy go, I'm just gonna, I have an idea what I wanna do. 
you know, and then to let him just go ahead and do it and be comedic with it. If you d he didn't know me and trust me already, that might be like a very, I don't think, you know, as a general rule, you know, you want to vet <clears throat> the artist before letting the artist paint the canvas in your house. You know what I mean? And so that's my metaphor too, by the way. The artist metaphor is mine as well. Um, trademark, trademark, <laughs> stamp, stamp. And so, um, yeah, yeah. What was your question? <laughs> <laughs> how much of the characters, those little brief snippets, were in the script, and how much was you just kind of goofing off and doing your goofy thing? I'd sent uh, Todd helping, and I'd sent uh, Greg like a, one of the variations that you saw when I was trying to figure out what avenue the character was going to take comedically, and because you don't want to. I mean, ultimately, I'm having a lot of fun, as you said originally, with it, but you don't want to upset the cart. You don't want to pull the carpet out from, um, from what we're trying to do. You want to actually contribute and have this element, in this instance it's a comedic element, be one that isn't disruptive to the story but actually aids and abets it. You know, I've always felt like, like in the original Iron Man, um, even if you go back to like the Star Wars thing, like in, in times of greatest crisis, there was there were moments of comedy between you know, Chewie and Han, and wherever you went to, to look, they, had, like, they hadn't forgotten that making an audience laugh is one of the quickest ways to bring them to your side. So that's sort of what's, what's occurring here. And basically they wrote like, you know, the roughest schematic, and then I went to town. And I mean, they, they could have released an entire episode with those four characters. I would say that the award for tolerance goes to Danielle Panabaker and Carlos Valdez for sitting through, because they would just run the camera and I would just go. And like, so there's a lot of stuff that we couldn't use, like the French mime was, you know, unabashed, the, the, you know, it, it was essentially a, a shameless day of performing that we cut down to the stuff that we could use and still tell a story about The Flash. <laughs>